something I have no experience or problem with. That's <laughs> uh, however, I did look and read a little closer at the bench eating stuff, but you know how that goes. Um, what I will tell you is that even though this is a major problem, um, you will see it mostly in younger women, a few young men up to probably about the 30s. We're probably going to see a little bit more of it as some of these baby boomers age into middle age to older adults uh, because they've probably been having problems with eating disorders their entire life. Um, just as an FYI, the only inpatient treatment area that I found for eating disorders in North Carolina is UNC Chapel Hill, uh, the hospital, the psych hospital there. Um, in Charlotte, there are several outpatient treatment areas, but there is no inpatient treatment in this part of the state, in Solomon Chapel Hill. All right. So let's talk about some eating disorders. Well, how do you tell the difference between anorexia and bulimia? Well, if you look at the, dif the major difference that I saw is the patient's weight. Anorexics are under normal body weight, usually severely underweight with about 62% of them exhibiting bulimic behaviors, okay? Bulimics are at usually at nearly normal, normal or sometimes even slightly overweight. Some of those people also have a history of anorexia. So the difference between the two is anorexic patients are underweight, whereas your patients with bulimia have near normal or slightly above body weight. Typically what you see with anorexia is that that weight is lost dramatically by decreasing caloric intake and or increasing physical exercise. You know, we all laugh about, well, I'm going to have to walk a mile for this to eat this piece of chocolate cake. Basically, what you'll find is that your anorexics will actually figure out the number of calories that it takes to burn to basically minimize or zero out their intake of food. Okay? Your bulimics, basically what you see with those folks is those binge purge cycles. Okay? where they will eat, overeat, and then undo that eating by either exercising, but the more, more often what you'll see is vomiting to rid themselves of that food. Okay? So with bulimics, again, normal body weight, cycles of binging and purging. Now, how do you tell the severity of each of these problems? Well, how severely underweight are they? Basically, the lower the BMI, the more severe the condition might be. What is normal BMI? Below 30, but what's, what's the, the range? 22 to 19 to 30, okay? So basically what you'll see with these anorexics, their BMI is going to be below 19. Again, with bulimics, the severity is determined by how frequent they binge purge. Once a week, twice a week, versus six times a day, every time they eat. The more they binge purge, the more severe the condition is. Some of these people you recognize been in the news. Princess Di. One of the things that triggered her bulimia was being told that she was fat with the newspaper. 
Janet Jackson, Paul Abdul, Halle Berry, one of the Olsen twins. I mean, she almost looked skeletal. I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of Laura Flint Boyle as well. She really looked bad, too. These are just some other people that have anorexia and bulimia, just to give you an idea. This person up at the top left is <coughs> Heinrich, an Olympic gymnast judge, told her she needed to lose weight in order to make the U.S. team. She developed anorexia, died at the age of 22. She weighed 60 pounds. Heidi Gunther. One in the middle was a ballet dancer. Any of you seen Black Swan? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, she was told by the theater company she was too heavy. She's 5'5 five five and weighed 96 pounds then. She developed bulimia and died at under 70 pounds. Margot Hemingway over here. Uh, Ernest Hemingway's granddaughter. Uh, developed bulimia. Um, she also has a very, very long history of depression and alcoholism. And um, she died at 22 as well. Uh, that's suicide, though. Okay. Karen Carpenter, those of us that grew up in the 80s, Love the Carpenters. Karen died of cardiac arrest at the age of 22. I think she was 80 pounds as well when she died. Um, Shaw Rand's daughter basically had anorexia and bulimia and died from a drug overdose because she could not deal with that any longer. Now, there's another type of eating disorder, and that's binge eating. It's a, a variant of compulsive overeating. Basically, with binge eating, it resembles that of obesity, except what you find is that uh, there's some recurrent episodes of thinking about and eating large amounts of food in a very short period. Um, Binge eating disorder, you may hear it referred to as BED, not BED, but BED. It's a new disorder in the DSM-5, and one of the things you'll see is it is a symptom of depression. Now, with binge eating, you see high rates of mood disorders and personality disorders. Um, history of major depression, more often than non-binge eaters. And one of the things that you see is that people that binge eat report that the eating is very soothing and helps to regulate their moods until they finish the eating. And then what you will see is that often they are have feelings of disgust uh, towards their behavior and a decrease in what they feel their self-worth is. Basically, with binge eating, you may see those people develop bulimia in the future. <laughs> now, obese binge eaters, basically there's no attempt to restrict dietary intake. Uh, basically, one of the things that you'll see is that treatment is behavior mod, improvement of depressive symptoms, a little SSRI always helps a little bit, and hopefully achievement of the appropriate weight. Um, basically, what you're going to see with these is that behavioral modification is going to work to help with the mood disorders as well. Now, Prader-Willi syndrome. Uh, Prader-Willi syndrome is one of the genetic disorders that you can see. Um, basically, what happens is that there is a transposition and either a defect in or a lack of seven of the chromosomes. Uh, I think it's on 
17, but it doesn't really matter. Just remember it's genetic. Uh, typically what you'll see with these folks um, is a chronic feeling of hunger that leads to overeating. They have no on-off button. You know, like the majority of us, if we eat, get full, these children never get full. No matter how much they eat, that satiety button never goes off. So what you often see with prater willi syndrome is that these are the families that have to lock their refrigerator or lock their cabinets or else the child will continue to eat until there's no food left in the house. Okay. Typically what you'll find is that early recognition and behavior modification may help with treatment, but the obesity from this disorder can be life-threatening. Um, they just lack the hypothalamic regulation that occurs with SAMI. Now, some of your comorbid disorders that you see with anorexia, bulimia, binge eating, are these. Depression, anxiety, social phobias. Basically what you'll find is that a lot of these young ladies, and I'm going to use that because typically 90% of the people that will have anorexia or bulimia are women. Um, average age of onset is middle adolescent to early adulthood. Um, basically with the social phobias what you'll see is avoidant behavior they do not interact with a lot of their peer groups or if they do interact with their peer groups unfortunately they are people that may also have anorexia or bulimia um, and they don't avoid social situations where food is served um, basically a lot of obsessive compulsive uh, behaviors will occur in this group. About 26% of them have OCD uh, where they have a special way that they have to eat their food. Typically what you will find is that sometimes they will cut a piece of meat into as small a piece as possible, line those up, and then just move it around on their plate so that it looks like they've been eating and they typically have not. Or they may only eat two or three small pieces and then immediately go to the treadmill and exercise what those calories are off. Okay. Um, access to diagnoses, we don't really use that terminology that much anymore. But whenever you're talking about that or someone mentions that, uh, you may... Uh, those are your personality disorders that you guys did. And a lot of time what you will see is that borderline personality disorder um, is most commonly associated with binge eating, um, avoidant behaviors in a lot of your folks with anorexia or bulimia. Um, the other thing that is often comorbid with eating disorders is that perhaps in 20 to 50 percent of these people have been sexually abused. Um, and in fact, it's really interesting to note that among those who have been sexually or physically abused, there are twice as many boys with binge and purge sym symptoms as girls. Now, I've seen some athletes, especially wrestlers trying to make weight, do binge and purge, or not eat, for, or fast for several days and just drink water, trying to make weight. Sweat suit with trash bags, the whole nine yards. <coughs> so, those are types of things that you will see. Um, Typically, though, with a lot of your wrestlers, they just do it during the season, and they don't during the other parts of the year. 
One of the other things that you need to remember is that another thing you need to watch out for is the risk for suicide. About a third of the people that suffer from eating disorders do actually commit suicide. Some of that may be due to the depression. Some of it may be due to some other reasons. Now, genetics. Well, they think there's some genetic predisposition because they found that there's about a 70% concordance in, in identical twins, meaning that if one twin develops an eating disorder, it's 70% likely that the other twin will develop it as well. They also see that uh, female relatives of people with eating disorders are up to 12 times more likely to develop an eating disorder than the general population. So there must be some genetic um, In both anorexia and bulimia, again, viral serotonin is abnormal. So what they're thinking is that uh, with this, they're not sure which comes first, chicken or the egg. Because one of the things that you need to develop serotonin is an, an amino acid called tryptophan. Okay? And if you don't, and the only way that we get tryptophan is through dietary intake. So if you don't have that precursor or that amino acid that it's necessary to develop serotonin, then you're going to have low levels or abnormal levels. So they're not sure if these women or men that have eating disorders started with low serotonin to begin with and then even lowered it further because they're not doing dietary intake of tryptophan or if it's just sort of a circular problem. Okay. The other thing is that... Uh, one of the ways that we do treat some of your eating disorders is SSRI. And what they're, they found is that antidepressants that treat or boost serotonin basically don't improve their mood symptoms until that underweight person approaches a near normal weight. So it may take a while for that person to develop for that SSRI to work for that person. Um, there are some family factors. Typically what you will see with people that have eating disorders is a very passive father, domineering mother, and an overly dependent child. Uh, basically, what happens is there's a very high level of perfectionism expected in the family. And what the child often feels they're not able to meet those standards. So what you may see is that that eating behavior may be a rebellion against that perfectionism because it's the only area of their life that they can control. Typically what you find is that symptoms are triggered by some type of stressor that causes loss of control in their life. Now clinically this is what we see. Because of the loss of weight that these people undergo, physiologically this is what I see. Number one is amenorrhea. Remember, because of the weight loss, I posted a new set of handouts, guys. I'm sorry. Some of the slides look the same, but some of them are added. Amenorrhea, basically what you will see is because you get that pituitary feedback loop gets out of whack. So sometimes the amenorrhea will proceed the anorexia bulimia, but the majority of the time when this person loses weight, they become amenorrheic. They will have abnormal thyroid functioning. 
systemically what you see are orthostatic changes, low blood pressure, bradycardia. Sometimes you will hear a heart murmur. What do you think that sudden cardiac arrest is often due to? Hypokalemia. Okay. And the electrolyte imbalances. <clears throat> you see a prolonged QT interval, meaning that the beat of the ventricle is prolonged. What happens is that there's likely to be another beat or a premature beat on top of that, and they will develop that sudden cardiac arrest because their heart is not able to uh, recover because of the low potassium level. Leukopenia, leukocytosis, uh, long term fatty degeneration of the liver, elevated cholesterol levels, which makes very little sense, right? If they're not doing an intake, how can they elevate cholesterol? Well, it's because they have degeneration of the liver and the liver is not able to synthesize that cholesterol. Osteoporosis, <coughs> because they're not having the calcium intake. And basically what happens is that in order for that body to retain its ability to autoregulate calcium, it leaches them from the bones. Nursing diagnoses, and these are the ones that we see for anorexia. Probably number one, of course, is going to be imbalance of nutrition, less than body requirements. But these probably are going to be your top three physiological, decreased cardiac output, risk for injury related to electrolyte imbalance, risk for imbalance fluid volume. Psychological, this is going to be your number one, disturbed body image. Because your women with anorexia feel that food is the enemy. That no matter how thin they are, they see themselves as fat. You may see skin and bones, but what they see in the mirror is fat. Anxiety, chronic low self-esteem are up there as well. Okay. Remember, they're using that withholding food from themselves as one of their coping mechanisms. So in order for them to gain weight and correct some of these physiologic methods, we've got to give them an other coping mechanism instead of just taking that away. Now with bulimia, a couple of the other things that you see, you can get a cardiomyopathy or an enlargement of the heart. And often that is due to the serotonin hepatic toxicity. One of the reasons that they took syrup of Ipecac off of the shelves and put it behind the counter is because of bulimia. You have to get it from the pharmacist. Um, metabolic acidosis, hypochloremia, hypokalemia. Again, a lot of electrolyte imbalances. One of the key things that you see with bulimics is erosion of teeth. And why do you think that occurs? <coughs> From the stomach acid. Again, you see diminished chewing ability because of those changes in the teeth. But the more often that these people purge, the more that you will see those parotid glands become enlarged. Esophageal tears can occur because of that self-induced vomiting. You may also see Russell's sign. 
and Russell sign basically are just calluses on the knuckle from sticking their finger down their throat and causing themselves to vomit. Now, some of your nursing diagnoses for bulimia are similar. Okay? Remember, this usually is not alter nutrition less than body requirements because they're taking in enough calories to maintain their weight. But you will see that decreased cardiac output because of the electrolyte disturbances and the cardiomyopathy. Disturbed body image, powerlessness, and again, ineffective coping. Substance abuse and impulsive response to problems often is an additional issue that you will see with your bulimics. The outcomes we want are that the weight will stabilize within normal parameters. We want those abnormal eating patterns to either decrease or cease. You sort of consider it a victory if their cycle of binge purge has been five to six times a day and now it's one or two times a week. It's great that we want it to decrease. You definitely don't want them to die from that eating disorder. A lot of the times we see these people in the hospital, it's because of the severe electrolyte imbalances that they come in with. We want them to exercise appropriately. Six hours a day in the gym is not appropriate. An hour, maybe. We want... One of our goals to be that they eat 50% of the meals offered at least 50% of the time. <laughs> and that may be a serious struggle that you're going to see. Because often what you will find is that your idea of what 50% of the meal might be and what their idea might be is totally different. Now, pharmacologically, this is the one we need to remember. What is Zyprexa? It's an atypical antipsychotic. One of the ones that you use most often, it will increase weight gain, it will pr improve cognition and body image. Prozac, an SSRI. Basically, it's the one that they use most often. However, you see somewhat mixed results. One of the things you need to remember about if you're using an SSRI like Prozac, it is typically given at three times the normal dose that you would give it to for depression. So typically 60 milligrams might be the dose that this patient would get. Now there's not, this is not on the slide, but Topamax. Topamax is an anticonvulsant. And Topamax is one that they often would use with patients with binge eating. Typically what you'll see with that is there's a significant reduction in the incidence of binges and sometimes even a reduction in body weight if they have the binge eating with obesity. Treatment. The most time that we will see them is in the medical unit. Again, treating them with the electrolyte imbalances and trying to get them to um, stabilize that weight. Unfortunately, what happens sometimes is that because these people continue to refuse food, TPN, or total parenteral nutrition, 
or two feedings have to be done to help stabilize their medical condition. After they medically stable, then usually you will see intensive psychiatric unit treatment, especially those that have the most severe anorexia. And typically what you will find is that the intensive outpatient treatment is done pretty much the rest of their life. Majority of time, cognitive behavioral therapy. Basically, behavioral modification. So that what happens is that the patient will perceive that they're in control. And typically what you will see is that they're allowed the contract for privileges based on their weight gain. In other words, you want to use your cell phone, then you have to gain this much weight before you can use that cell phone. You want to watch TV, then you have to gain this much weight or eat this much food off the plate without binging and purging. Basically, Behavior Mod works well to help restore the weight, but typically what you have to do is that psychodynamic therapy or the uh, dialectical behavioral therapy to get to the reason that this person developed this eating disorder. Was it a sexual abuse problem? Is it depression? any of those other comorbid problems that you'll see. But one of the things you guys need to remember is that eating disorders typically do not resolve unless there's family therapy. Remember you've got that domineering mom, very passive dad. So behavioral therapy for the family needs to be initiated. Vitamins, yoga, meditation, acupuncture are some things that have been tried with varying results. Um, I haven't seen studies one way or the other that say they're helpful. Definitely they're not harmful. But as they are not uh, useful as primary treatments, it's mostly the behavioral modification and family therapy. With communication guidelines, what we want to see is that when you're talking with patients with anorexia that are restricting food, patients with bulimia are more readily available to talk to you. Um, typically what you'll find is that the anorexics often hide their behavior, whereas the bulimics are typically more open. Um, developing a sense of trust with these patients is extremely helpful. Um, however, you as the nurse need to make sure that you're very judgmental and making sure that you're not domineering or very authoritarian, very similar to what mom was, because that can contribute to the problem. Um, You've got to remember that the patient is very sensitive to the perception of others and often what we, we will call a body dysmorphic syndrome where they may be very, very thin, 70 to 80 pounds, but they see themselves as weighing 200 or more. Okay? So that you have very, very altered <coughs> body image. Um, often these patients feel a lot of shame and totally out of control, and that food is one of the ways that they feel control of their lives. Don't take that away without giving them an alternate coping mechanism. Priorities are going to be safety related. 
They're going to be having that increased risk for suicide. Remember I told you a third of them do commit suicide. Their risk for death from the cardiac dysrhythmias or the electrolyte imbalances. Um, we want to prevent and treat those diseases, diseases that are related to that eating disorder like the fatty liver disease or elevated cholesterol, hematuria, proteinuria. Um, basically, impaired cognition. If the brain does not get enough calories, typically what you're going to see is a very poor response in thinking uh, with, with that. One of the things that has to be done before treatment can occur is that that patient has to recognize there's a problem. If they don't see it as a problem, then treatment is not going to be very successful. What we want to do is to continue an ongoing treatment support system, a network of both family support, support for that patient, um, and making sure that it continues on. Like I said, you know, typically we've seen these from adolescence to about age 30, but we're starting to see some of the baby boomers continue with eating disorders throughout. Again, our attitudes as nurses need to be looked at. You know, eating disorder, uh, sometimes we tend to regard it as fairly trivial. I mean, if you look at it compared to schizophrenia, well, you don't want to lay blame on that patient. Then it's your own fault. You would just eat something. Um, nurses believe that we... They choose those risky behaviors and blame the patient. And sometimes that is not the case. Remember, this is the way that they are expressing their coping mechanism. And we need to make sure that we are giving them something or better ways to cope than withholding food or binging and purging. Typically what you will see is that that terror of weight gain Scale is not their friend. What you will find is that some of these people have been weighing themselves up to 15 times a day. What we want to try to get them to do is to decrease that to two to three times a week. And that's how we want to gauge their weight gain. Because basically when they're using that weight 15 times a day, they were trying to figure out, well, how much can I eat? What can I not eat? Just as an FYI, these people that are anorexic do feel hunger. You typically do not lose the sensation of hunger until you get less than 200 calories a day. And some of these people do go less than 200 calories a day, which is a scary, scary thought.